are you? I'm good. I uh, I spent my morning watching all the video I could find of you and this book. Gosh, it was awesome. Oh, I just God. finished the book this morning. Did Ow. you? Yay! I really, really enjoyed it. There were parts uh, that made me cry. Uh, me too. Yeah. Me too. I finished it last week while I was on spring break. Or winter think, break. It's not spring. Not right. yet. <laughs> yeah, I do hear the people. It's funny because I don't often cry in books myself, but I have been told people cry a bit. But I'm hoping it's sort of happy tears by the end. Yes, or... yes, they were they were happy tears. Yeah, because I, I was... sorry. Go ahead. No, the only book I can remember crying in more recently was um, in the Age of Innocence of all books, the Edith Wharton book, in the bit where it sort of deals with the idea of a lost love, and I found that really moving. But. I don't remember. I think I cried in Night when I read it by Ellie Wiesel for the first time. Sorry, you were saying, Tracy? So there's a scene in your book where your mom is in that line and they're counting off as to who who's not going to go to Auschwitz. And I'm like, I've heard this scene before. Where have I, where did I listen to it? Mitch Album wrote basically that same scene in his latest book, Little oh, Life. Wow. And wow, I just I finished that a few weeks ago. And I'm like, right. it was so fresh. Yeah. And I'm like, I can just, I can picture it. Yeah, that's incredible. I wonder, um, maybe he got it from my mother's testimony. I don't know. I don't, I don't uh, know. No, no, but... I'm not, I'm not really saying that. I think that there were so many similarities between people and I've had so many people write to me and say, um, I feel like you're telling my grandparents' story or my mother's story mm -hmm. and they're sure, they're absolutely sure that my mother would have known them. But what I think that in the great horror that was the Holocaust was there was a systematic way of dealing with people that repeated over and over again. And so some of those stories were really similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a fantastic book too. But before everyone gets here, I thought I should share, especially since my mom is here. I <laughs> <laughs> have very 80s hair. <laughs> in in honor of our our origin, <laughs> uh, I put on hairspray today. <laughs> <laughs> I, however, I did not have any spritz forte, so I was, you know. It's not perfect, but it's close. <laughs> well, oh, my gosh. son is a senior this year, and one of his classes that he just started this semester is Global History Through Film. Mm. Um, so he started that in January. And as I'm starting to read your book, he, in his class, was watching Schindler's List right. as the first movie they watched in their global history class. And he has a tendency to come home and tell every little detail of what happened. So it's like I'm hearing him talk about what's happening to the people in the movie at the same time that I'm reading about the stuff with your mother's childhood, thinking her future is what he's describing to me when things yeah. get worse. <laughs> and that and that film itself really influenced me because I remember, first of all, when I saw it, that film is set in the Camp Plushov, which was the first camp my mother went to. And it was, so. it was sort of my, I, I made that connection of, wow, this is actually my mother's history too, although she didn't uh, meet Schindler. And then I realized, I guess, that you could have these really important messages through art. Of course, I knew that, you know, from reading, but I didn't really see it as pertaining the Holocaust, that you could create something that would then go on to be meaningful. And I, you know, Steven Spielberg is so amazing and he started the Shoah Foundation with the proceeds of that film, I believe. And they really inspired Holocaust centers all over the world to take testimonies, one of which was my mother, which ended up, I think it's also in, in Los Angeles, uh, sorry, in Washington at USHMM as a result of the whole Shoah Foundation project. And that was incredible. It's just, it's just one of those little ironies of life that we're both doing something 
with that particular part of history at the same time. Yeah. Let's see if I can find it. This <clears throat> is this the the um, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Is that your your mom's Shoah interview? Well, yes, I, I, it's not actually a Shoah interview in that it was uh, it originated with the Melbourne Holocaust Museum, but they passed it on there as well. But yeah, she's done a couple, and that's one of them. Got it. And that was you, one of our questions. I'm going to put that link into the. the that chat. was my question, Heather, and uh, I very much wanted to. I thought you you said that you had. I think you said there were four interviews with her besides your own with her, and um, for these different archives. And I was hoping maybe there's one that's online so that we could hear it. Yes, that's the one. There was one that she did before that one, and. The interview, the interviewer and her didn't didn't gel exactly. Perhaps it was partly because it was the first interview she gave, and her questions were quite short, and she had a strange demeanor throughout it. And when my father saw it, he said, "I really think you should redo this." And she got an interviewer who was just, I think, understood maybe the questions to ask her in particular better, and maybe because she was more aware of it, she answered that. The other set of interviews she did, which weren't online, is from my friend Elliot Perlman. He's an author, an Australian author, whose Holocaust book that he wrote is called The Street Sweeper. And he met my mother around the same time that he was writing that book and really implored me. He said, she's got to do more than these couple of hour interviews, as good as they are with the Holocaust Museum. I feel like we need to do more. And so he took it on to interview her over about somewhere between eight and 10 hours. And in fact, he thanks her in his book, The Street Sweeper. And there was a, you know, the, the book is all about how the world is connected and all these strange coincidences. And at the time when he was interviewing her, he was looking for somebody who might have witnessed the hanging of resistance leader Rosa Robota in Auschwitz. She had tried to smuggle gunpowder to the Sonder Commando in the view that they would team together and blow up the the um, gas chambers and make a run for it. And she got caught. There wasn't a small uprising, but, you know, a lot of prisoners got killed and she got hung as a result. And Elliot had traveled all over the world trying to look for this person. He followed leads to Poland. They came up short. And when he was interviewing my mother, at the end of one of the interviews, he said, oh, by the way, I don't suppose that you ever heard of this woman, Rosa Robota. And it turned out that even though he'd traveled overseas, she was the one who he used as a witness because she had been an eyewitness. And so he thanks her in that. And it was kind of incredible that sitting under his nose, virtually in his backyard all along, was the key to that puzzle. Amazing. Truly amazing. I, I think the the happenstance of what happened to your mother, um, I mean, she was obviously such an incredible person. It's just amazing to read about her. And you feel like you know her at the at the end. And uh, but the fact that things, you know, in some things that was just luck, um, it seems like, although you have to believe that, you know. It was meant to be for her to survive this, to, to go through so much. It was just really, it's heartbreaking and yet inspiring to see how how she kept her spirits up. Yeah. I mean, I think two things that you said are really true of her. Number one, she was remarkable. She was a really unusually buoyant, optimistic person who no felt connected to the world around her and I think as a result people felt connected to her and she never forgot that so many people intervened to save or help her in acts you know both small and grand but I also think she was lucky yet I know that anyone who survived the holocaust was lucky because numbers weren't on their side statistically speaking you walked into a death camp you did not walk out of it and I've realized that with all these people, so many things had to happen at so many instances, not just one of being saved, but many, 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 many repeating incidences of things going their way and could so easily have gone the other way. But I think, you know, you had to be, you had, to, you did have to have that luck. 
you had to have been strong physically to survive. You had to have be strong mentally to survive because, you know, it was an era designed to really break these prisoners in so many ways. Well, you're bringing that up. I noticed that when she got separated from her brother, her brother passed away quite quickly. Do you think that's because he was no longer having to look out for his sister? It was easier for him to possibly give up. But while they were still in the same camp, he had someone that he had to look after in his mind, maybe? I mean, in theory, that makes sense. It's so hard to speculate on things you don't know. But just judging by the people I did know from my mother's family, both from what she told me and the two brothers I knew who survived and my mother, I just don't think they were a giving up kind of family. So, you know, at the end of the war, my mother didn't know if anyone had survived and she was, she knew that several had not. So I think it was just that he had just been subjected to punishing conditions that it was impossible to survive. There were two versions of, what had happened to him, but most likely he was really worked until his death, that he was sick. There was a lot of sickness in that camp. That was a really labor intensive, all the camps were punishing, but where he ended up was really, really difficult. And I just think people deteriorated quickly, certainly as strong as my mother was mentally and physically at a point, if camp for her had gone on for a year longer, she wouldn't have survived it. It was it's no wonder that people who were in there earlier died. But I remember reading a statistic. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but the time within which you died from arriving at camp was a very short one. So it's not that, I don't think it was that he gave up. I think it was that he had at some point terrible things happen. He might've, there was also one person thought that he might've been shot too. So I would imagine there's kind of a ticking clock once once you got off the train that the uh, every day your your coin toss it's always fifty fifty but at some point it's gonna run out on you that you've just gotten a, a good toss too many times and exactly there's so many there were so many ways to destroy life it was unbelievable at that time yes they were very creative. There were things in your book that I didn't know they were doing. I mean, some of the stuff, like Tracy said, you know, it's, you kind of expect it, but it's very different to read that from, I mean, for me, it was very different to read that because it was you and, and Mira and I got, I got to have Shabbat dinner with Ra Rochelle and, and her mom when she was in New York city, um, in the nineties, our hair was shorter. I mean, yeah, less I, and elevated. I've lost some of that. I've lost some of that <laughs> <fonts. laughs> but the um to to see to see those things so much more intimately is a completely different experience from just kind of you know watching Schindler's List or something, which is superior, but it's kind of different when it's such a personal person. And I actually had a question for you about how you started the book. So every everybody here loves books and loves literature and many people write on their own as well. I have a question about how you started the book. I, I listened to it. So I got to hear you at the beginning, which was awesome. I'm like, oh my God, it's Rochelle. And then uh, Rachel takes over and she does a beautiful job. And she doesn't start with your mom. The story starts with the other, the gentleman, David. David. Yeah. yeah and David I, I was like, okay, this is interesting because this did not start the way I thought it was going to. So what was it that finally made you decide? Because I imagine there was some retooling and reworking as you went. Yeah, no, there was. And in fact, it didn't start there originally. It started with the chapter afterwards where my mother is deteriorating and I'm trying to uh, reconcile that, reconcile the image I have of her of being this vibrant person who put on coral lipstick every day to the one that was before me with her gray pallor and her voice changing. And then actually my son, Julian, we were talking about it and he's now a film student. But he was saying, I really love the story about David. I really think you should have that at the beginning. And I went, hmm, 
maybe I should. And I thought I'm going to like write it. I think I'd already written it a bit later. And I thought I'm going to write that and see if it belongs there. And I realized because it was so out of what was happening afterwards, um, it was good there. And it was good there also because I, I, first of all, I needed to have some separation between the stories. I didn't want to put all the Holocaust stories in one bunch and then have the reader kind of tire of what's going on. So I think I left it as a reminder, this is what is going to happen. So you feel that sense of dread when you, even though it starts out in an idyllic village in Czechoslovakia, you understand what might lie ahead. And then after discussions as well, it was my agent who just, who sounds like I barely wrote the book, but then my agent, when she read it, said, I'd love, I'd love to see a prologue before then. I said, oh, let me try that as well. Those are really actually the only two suggestions that I had that I, I took up. And I think that the David part, I think they all would have happened naturally anyway, because writing is a bit like, like I think composing music you compose something and then you think that's not quite right. I need, my ear tells me it needs something else there. And I, you, you realize that as you're writing. And that's really how I came to weave in bits of myself in as well. I started to realize that the reader needed a bit of a break from what was happening. I felt strongly that I wanted to talk about it from my perspective. And I also wanted to, as I was alluding to before, not just put one horror in after another at the point where it does get horrific, because I think for those who've read Holocaust stories, there's a chance you get desensitized from them. You read, you know, one person dying another, and then by the time you get to number four, you might not invest anything in that. And I wanted people to be shockly, uh, uh, shocked freshly anew each time and yeah. really feel connected to that story. So that was that was kind of how it unfolded. But I didn't write, if, if it wasn't already obvious, I didn't have a plan when I <laughs> sat down at the computer to write. And I had tried to plan it. I, a few years earlier, I had written a whole chapter breakdown as was suggested, and I just got stuck and I got uninspired. The plan didn't look that good to me. And I thought, I, I, I'm not even sure what I have here. And it really discouraged me. So when it actually came time to sitting down and writing, I just thought, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go through all the material I've got about my mother in kind of a linear way and go back and forth in time in terms of my story and her story. And again, listening to what that section needs, like music. It's a beautiful it's piece of music. Yes, it is. It is. I, I was just, when you were describing the... Um the foreshadowing sort of thing. It reminded me of that, uh, I can't remember what the word for it would be, but I think you said, it, I think Heather, you said it was Bertolt Brecht that would set every, would tell you what was going to happen and then you were shocked and horrified anyway. Yeah. And it reminded me of that book, uh, They Both Die at the End. Yes. Where you know it's just going to be awful. The, the but title you, tells you. But, but part of your head says, no, 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 it can't. They, they really, no one would do this. No, 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 no. But it, it, it did. It happened over and over, to, like you said, to so many people. Yeah. And your mother was just so remarkable. And, uh, and I think actually that sense of disbelief was one I really wanted to have because at first you see it from the townspeople's perspective. Like they hear that Germans are coming into their town. They've heard vague reports of other things happening in other places, but they actually can't believe it because they come up with the, they say, this is a civilized nation. Nothing would happen. They're cultured, they're educated. And I think just being protected within their own society, they felt they felt nothing would happen. They felt very much integral to the fabric of their community, which I think you see. And so I think it is such a singular event that it is hard to believe it has happened. And I did want to keep up that sense of disbelief the whole way through. And I think you even, I've had a lot of readers tell me how shocked they were that after liberation, things were still not rosy, that You've got this idea that once everyone is freed from camp, it's 
everything works out okay. But my mother still had to endure a lot of challenges and obstacles before she was really free in lots of ways. And I wanted people to realize just the scope of this event in, in at least through telling it through her, just one person's eyes. It's, it's been a long time since I read Elie Wiesel's night, but my memory is that he, he was not liberated by the Russians. He was liberated by the Americans. Is that right? I think so too. And it's been, you know, I avoided myself rereading any Holocaust books because I was so nervous about acts, you know, subconsciously mimicking a style. I would have so been. So I avoided rereading it as well. But yes, I think so. And certainly people who were liberated by Americans did have that uh, idea that we think of where, although not all of the people who liberated them yeah. knew what to do with, with, prisoners who were so malnourished and so sick so sometimes their best intentions went awry but uh, I think the experiences were very different depending on where you were liberated from who liberated you and how much time passed before you got to the place you wanted to at the end yeah as you were as I was reading through that section and I realized it was kind of a chase you know it, that was the action movie moment as who's going to get there first I was like, oh, please don't let it be the Russians. Oh, please don't let it be the Russians. Oh, crap. It's the Russians. <laughs> Damn it. But, but again. Feeling. I kind of felt like the Russians were going to be there while I was reading it just because of the location of where they were at. Yeah. You were paying more attention to your geography than I was. Well, I, was I lived just in Germany for a few years, too. So. Really? Yes. My husband was in the military, and um, we were over there for five years total so that kind of helps with the geography when you're living in the middle of it we were there when the wall fell oh. Ooh. what what yeah. what town were you in what base were you on um the first time he was there we were in a little town called Zweibrück near the French border and the next time he was stationed at Ramstein Air Force Base which um oh Kaiserslautern. I, I had to stop and think because we all called it K-Town. I was like, what's the actual <laughs> name of the town? <laughs> so, military are good at shortening things. Yes, yes, they are. Yes. And we went over across to Berlin on a USO tour right after the wall fell. And the stark between the east and the west was amazing in the differences because, you know, it's only been a few months. And two years ago, I went over to Germany with my son on a trip, and we were in Berlin. And it's like you can't hardly tell that there was such a drastic difference over, you know, it's been 30 years and all, but still, it's like the city has re rebound, but they still, it was quite poignant to walk across the part of the wall that was left and to see all of the murals that were put up there and to know that one time that circled a third of the city. Yeah. So. And and that was also interesting because I most of the stories that I had read before of uh, survivors or or just people who succeeded at surviving throughout the all of the trauma that they went through. Many of those stories were from people who came from towns that were ghettoized, whether it was the the Warsaw ghetto or or any of the other smaller smaller ghettos that were all scattered all over um, Eastern Europe, but your mom's town was not that. She was, not. she came from a, it seemed like a really good healthy place, and I thought your your timing could not be better at communicating the the fallacy of it can't happen here because clearly it can. And we need to be paying attention to that stuff right now too, I think. So well, I think a good morning. What I think I did, although I didn't plan to do this, was that you see the kind of the slow movement. So you understand that the Holocaust didn't start with monsters shoving people into gas chambers. It started with stereotypes being perpetuated and with a suspicion of people and just unbridled hatred allowed to go unchecked and a lack of others standing up and saying hang on what's happening and you know rights being slowly stripped away bit by bit and I think that we we do see that playing out now 
in a really real way. So I hope that people, you know, I've really tried to preach this as a lesson about humanity, about the importance of recognizing people as other humans and not putting people into boxes and just, I just think we all have to work together to get to a point of uh, peace for everyone. Yeah. yeah. I think that was one of the hardest things for me was to see where she grew up in a town where everyone was fine. You, you were good with your neighbors, Christian, Catholic, Jew, it didn't matter. You were friends. And then all of a sudden, slowly things got to change and where, oh, we can't go to school. We can't talk to these people. And, and everyone accepted it without saying, hey, why, why is this person that I grew up with all of a sudden person non grata and didn't question what was going on? That really is scary because it's like a slow boil. Yeah, yeah. It's being the frog in the pot. And I think that the, um, I think what that really also shows is how you know how subtle that is too that there's something below the surface it's not just about it you know I don't I think that that hatred must have been there or that distrust for Jewish people must have been there on some level all along because it doesn't rise out of nothing so it's I think it sort of also shows the importance of really educating people and understanding people on a much deeper level I'm sorry for my phone buzzing um, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to work out what to do with that. <laughs> I'll keep going. One of the, the uh, things that I did appreciate as a Christian is the detail you went into on the rights and the importance of the religion to your mother and her family. That really made me feel like these were people that really believed in what they were um, talking about and believed in their God and kind of grounded it for me a little bit more how much horrific it must have been and the fact that they didn't curse God when it happened but just worked through it and believed in him throughout the ordeal is really remarkable yeah I I think there's two parts of that too like I do think this is a story about my mother's love of Judaism and I, I try to really explain some of the tenets of Ju Judaism so that people understand it a bit more and I've had a lot of readers talking about the bits they relate to and the bits that they never knew about. But for me, this is a real story about faith. My mother's faith in God being one of the biggest ones, but also her faith in humanity, in herself, in the prospect of a brighter tomorrow. All those things are um, uh, were meaningful to her. But I think that one of the scenes that really struck out to me when I wrote it was that she did pray in camp, that when she arrived in camp, it was the Jewish New Year followed by the Day of Atonement. And it was important to her to observe those festivals to the extent that she was able to. And one of the ways she did that was through prayer. And there were prisoners who said, what are you doing? You know, who are you praying to? You think there's a God? And she said, yes, I do. And I think that my prayers might make a difference. And to me, what that stands for is the idea that small acts count. You, she didn't know what impact it would have, but she felt it would. And it was about the collective good that she was, that her act was a part of, that she hoped would make a difference. And I think there's something to that. We have to really believe that when we do an act as small as it is, if it's based in goodness, if it's based in trying to make things better, it counts and it matters. It's one I'm of the, the words... And you and you walk that talk every and I walk day. It. I do, Tracy. I do. The I, do. I, of... I have coworkers this morning that were thinking I was totally insane at six o'clock this morning when I said, "Happy Wednesday, have an amazing day." And I and do that not. regularly. I do that at seven o'clock on Monday mornings. And because you mean it. that's what I believe. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that I think. Um, it's it's so easy to let the little things like that go mm -hmm. and and i think we watch um the erosion of all these things that we thought were laws that turned out just to be norms it was just people behaved themselves nicely and and when you stop being surrounded by people who believe that you should be treating each other well it's that much more important to 
to stand up and say, no, it's, it is actually okay to say, I still believe that people are really good at heart. Mm -hmm. And if, and if we don't do that, then things are really dire. I, I agree. You do have to have faith that people can change, that they can be educated, that you can find a point of connection with them. And I think you have to keep trying to do that all along. Like one of the things I always think about is how my mother's idea was that despite unfathomable darkness, you always had to believe in the light beneath the surface. Even if you just couldn't see it, your first act was one of faith. And that's, I think, what you're talking about. You have to believe that people will respond to kindness. They'll respond to being connected with and sp spoken to as you would want to be spoken to. Well, and I, I also think there, not everybody here is Jewish. So there are two, two terms that have, um, that I don't, I don't remember hearing an analog for as specifically in Christianity. And one of them is, um, what you say when somebody's passed on is may their name be a blessing. And that's, that's a beautiful thing you, to have somebody's memory be a blessing. Just being able to talk about your mom is a blessing for all of us. The fact that you were able to write that book and, and share all of those stories with us. So you kind of did the, the Uber version of the blessing, but also the word mitzvah, which correct me if I'm wrong, can be translated as commandment, but it's also like a, a gener, a act of generosity or an act of, of grace that you're, you like, if you, um, if you decide to be an organ donor and you get that onto your, your driver's license and something happens and you, you die, your organs are given to somebody else who needs them. That's a mitzvah. And that's something that we don't talk about nearly enough, I don't think. Yeah, well, mitzvah literally translates to good deed. And, you know, there are many in the Torah that we are meant to observe, again, both sort of small and and large. And um, But the idea of when you're talking about being connected to my mother and writing about her still, it's interesting because I wrote this book really when I started, one of the things I wanted to do was to write my way out of grief. I just felt such a sense of loss of, over my mother's absence and I could not get my way through it. Years passed and I was still feeling completely unlike myself. And I'd always turn to words when something went wrong in life or where I needed guidance. And I couldn't find many books about parental loss there are books about losing a spouse or God forbid, losing a child, but not that much about losing a parent. And I thought I really need to write about this for other people out there as well. But by doing so, of course, I've kind of brought my mother to life again in this strange way and, and keep her living. And it's been incredible to go, I'm sure I would not feel like this if I'd written a different kind of book, but to go on a sort of an author's tour and speak about her and make her memory mean something to people. It, that's actually just phenomenal. Like, that, that's been a way that I didn't expect to have happen because with grief, you don't get to go, ha, form new memories. You have to mine and harvest all those scenes from the past. But in this really special way, I am bringing her to life anew because it's like when somebody passes away and someone else is showing you a photo of that person you've never seen and it's suddenly like you've got this brand new memory that you never had or they're telling you a story it's like that writ large all the time because people are telling me about their response to her and what specifically meant something to her and it's, it is just like she's continuing to do her good in the world in some way I, I love that very personal approach that you're taking and you've taken to this book but putting it back into the context of the Holocaust, because um, we have, I'm, I live in Tucson, Arizona, which probably seems like it's out in the outback. <laughs> um, so Kingman is in the outback. <laughs> so we're we have a fantastic um, Jewish history museum. And then from that has been built a lovely Holocaust center. And one of, there's two things they focus on. They, they focus on documenting the Holocaust survivor stories 
that are and and the children of the Holocaust survivor stories for to for our area. And I have several friends that are are part of that and are docents there. And but the other thing they do, and so that's a beautiful thing that they do, just in in the pictures of the families of the people who made it and the, of those that didn't, and and keeping that sort of alive. Um, but the other part of it is they really have shown that process that you talked about earlier, where it goes from from taking human beings and groups and turning them into non-humans. And it goes through that whole process and you can and so that you can see where it's happening. And so you you it really calls on all of us to be much more aware of those processes so that we can challenge them. But I think, that it's so important as we lose our Holocaust survivors that we have these stories to come back to so so we'll never forget. And yeah. so I, I'm so glad you did this. Well, I, I was really aware that with all the Holocaust survivors dying out and, you know, my mother would be 97 now almost and she was one of the younger survivors. The people who are alive now are largely child survivors um, and when it's their time to go, who is going to continue those stories? The book world kind of doesn't work that way where you're constantly dipping into the past. You need to really bring it to the fore. And so I was aware that there will be a whole generation of descendants writing their stories, and that's important. I didn't realize quite how important it would be. At the time, I thought, well, I, I don't want, there were already, you know, Holocaust deniers, and I thought, I'm going to do my best to make sure that no one can at least deny her story by making sure I've fact-checked it and verified everything I could and just making it as accurate as as possible. But beyond that, I really wanted to help people going through something much less big than the Holocaust because I really think that my mother had a template that was that was helpful to live by the way she saw the world and the way she saw the future and the idea that part of the way you live well is by shifting your perspective rather than necessarily shifting your circumstances in some cases um so there was certainly lessons about the holocaust anti-semitism prejudice and racism overall for sure hatred just you know normal hatred but I'd like to think there are the lessons on the flip side about love, about living, about living purposefully and joyfully as well, so that those two things stand side by side. I think you were very successful in that because you're not devastated at the end. You're rather uplifted and say, this was an amazing life. It was a brilliant life. And it's something that shows, and I, I think I told Heather, I called her up and said, may I never complain about anything ever again. <laughs> <laughs> well, life doesn't work that way, does it? Because I, did, um, I, I don't know that even though Mira was my mother, that I'm like that either. And you know what? Mira would have said complain, like she validated people's pain, even if it was tiny. But I think the point is to find a way to, make it feel less painful to see it in a perspective and work through it so that you can put it in your past. I don't think, I don't think as humans, we can really um, avoid things that niggle us and upset us. I also wondered how much, how much of her uh, ability to do that had something to do with like my entire interaction with you for the last 30 years <laughs> has has always been with you being a writer and not just a writer but a really good storyteller and I have boxes of letters from Michelle with photocopied uh magazine articles from all over the place that are sadly behind Aiden's wall right now so I couldn't get any of them out but uh but being a, a storyteller and having that kind of creative spark, it seemed like you you are an apple that did not fall far from the tree, that your mom, part of what, I can't help thinking part of what helped her was part of the shifting of perspective is 
turning it to the belief that tomorrow will be a better day. Next year in Jerusalem, it's tomorrow's going to be better than today was, even if today was worse than yesterday. Yeah. And that that's hard to do, but I think it's a good lesson. Yeah. I think um so on your point of being a storyteller, I think actually in my family we're all storytellers because my brother started Australia's first independent book publishing company with three others in the 70s. And he's, he doesn't do that anymore, but he really made a mark on the Australian publishing industry. Um, my sister Lillian is an artist, which is a different kind of storytelling, but storytelling nevertheless. And she actually also has written. And my sis, other sister Jeanette is a psychologist. And I think that's about hearing other people's stories too. Um, but I do think I was thinking about how my mother, how, I was trying to work out if my mother's way of shifting perspective applied itself in my own life. And the thing I remembered was when I had my car accident. So I write about having a tuk-tuk accident in Thailand, which was pretty devastating at the time. I was in hospital afterwards, after being airlifted from, or medevaced rather from Thailand, I was in hospital for three months and then another two months as an outpatient. I had a series of operations, more than a dozen. And at the very beginning of all this, I was lying in hospital bed and really just so upset with the world. I really felt like the world owed me a better deal. My life had been derailed. I was really angry and upset about that. And one of the things I also complained about was how my leg looked. I knew that I'd be left with a pretty significant scar it's similar to a burn patient where it wraps around my whole leg. At the time it was misshapen because I didn't have plastic surgery to make my legs look even. And I was saying to uh, my mother how terrible this injury was. And she sort of shrugged her shoulders and said, oh, well, so what? You won't wear mini skirts again. And then I, I said, but I, I want to wear mini skirts. I was really angry. And after a bit, I thought about it and I thought, but hang on, even when I had two actually perfect seeming legs, I didn't wear mini skirts because in my head, I perceived that there was something wrong with them, that, I, that my legs weren't perfect enough to wear mini skirts. And now here I actually did have an imperfect leg. I still wasn't going to wear them. And I thought <laughs> instead of like how, how I should have earlier seen my legs as absolutely great. And I started looking at my legs differently and, and valuing uh, form, a function over form, like just seeing how miraculously my leg had knitted together the skin that had been laid on it and how it was completely unscathed in terms of its movement. And that was a miracle in itself. And so I, I decided to really look at my scar as a badge of courage and that I was going to wear it in the world thinking how incredible the human body is. And I don't think I would have been able to do that without learning from my mother's perspective shift because she certainly wasn't wringing her hands and saying, oh my gosh, this is terrible for you. And, you know, she was very matter of fact about things. And so I think that's how I became too. And, and it did become a badge of courage for me. I think I, I want to share a picture of you with your mom that I pulled offline um, because I think it's easy for, it's easy for when, when you talk about the tuk-tuk accident for me, because we are about the same height, Rochelle is not diminutive. We are both like five, five, eight, five, how tall are you now? Yeah, five, eight. By now, now I know. <laughs> well, I haven't started shrinking yet, but I didn't That's want to. Right. Say so, Nira's <laughs> small, and and Rochelle is not, and so you getting flattened in that tuk tuk accident and being taken out for three months to me was one of those big. Um, even though it didn't happen to me, it was one of those big shifts of oh just because we're young and awesome we are not immune and that's that's a hard hard thing to learn but um yeah i think it was the first time i really realized that 
you know, life could throw curveballs at you and not go according to plan. But, you know, my mother had a really practical way of dealing with that too. She came every day to hospital and brought me blankets and fruit and made sure I was really comfortable. And, and we sat there and talked and it actually, in the end, was not the terrible experience that it sounded like. It, it was life-changing, but it wasn't, I don't think of it as a trauma now. Was did that you, before or after you... you went to university in, in California? Uh, it was after LA and before I moved to New York. So okay. it was in between. Yeah. Did she have that effect on everybody that she just clearly exudes, even in those pictures, this love of life and this joyousness about her spirit? And, yeah, uh, and did people really pick up on that about her? Well, and that photo that ran for Elle magazine, I'd written an article, that particular photo didn't run. That was an outtake where we were mucking around in between, <laughs> which sort of shows a much more real moment. But she, she did have that effect on people. Like I recently met her neighbor who I had not known before. And he was younger than her. He's probably in his seventies and comes from a very different background, both religiously. And I, I think he was, I'm not sure where he was raised, but he was just saying how they had, so, he used to come over and have coffee and lunch with her and he, he'd come with his wife and he came to her funeral, which was at a traditional Jewish cemetery where men and women were sat separately for the sermon at the beginning. And I just love that she reached all these people um, along the way that in the book, I write about the neighbor across the road, putting a note under the door saying how she was really sorry for the family's loss. And she hadn't even met Mira, but she just was sort of taken by her aura. And this was a woman younger than me, uh, complete, you know, a writer just from a different path as well. And I've heard it since she's died too. So many people telling me the effect she had on them. I just think she was one of those special people. Sometimes I wonder if, I remember at the beginning, I had this moment thinking, did I exaggerate her at all? And I caught up my <laughs> sister and I said, did you feel the same way? She said, yes. Um, because, you know, I, I know that she was really special. Well, thank you for sharing her with us and um, having her now be a part of yeah. our lives, which is really very special indeed. That makes me so happy to think that because I'm the sort of person that once I read a book, it's gone from my memory banks forever. Um, but it is so heartwarming to know that there are people who are reading about her and will remember, they might not remember every nuance of the story, but they'll remember something of her and her attitude and they'll take that away with them. I've really been, I had a woman write to me and she's going through radiation dealing with cancer. And she said, she keeps saying, she keeps replaying one scene in the book, which is where after when I was talking to my mother, I said, I, I just don't understand how you managed to move forward. Like, how did you not collapse in a heap? And one of the things she said was, I knew that was in the past and I had a future to live. And this woman going through radiation said that she was going to say the same to herself, that she knew that one day when she looked back on the radiation, she'd say, I know that's in the past, but I have a future to live. Um, another woman wrote to me and said that she feels like the book is preparing her for her father who's just entered palliative care, what that journey is going to be and where the beauty in that will lie as well, as well as the brutality of that. And I just, it's incredible to think that Mira, and I give her complete credit for it. You know, when people say they love the book, I'm not sort of thinking. You know, uh, Rochelle, we have a, a one, I think it's the fourth or third largest book festival in the United States. And it's coming up in March. It's up March of every year. And they would love you. And this would be, Please. I would have, I, if you would, don't mind, I might put your name forward. And uh, Please, and, everyone, oh. just you, your contacts, people. And then I, and then you'll, you can come and visit our, our museum and Holocaust Center too. And oh, yeah. meet some of my friends and yeah, that all also yeah. have books about their families. Um, some in Poland, some from Hungary, and yeah, really quite amazing stories. I just think you would be an amazing speaker for, for the festival. Well, I'd love to come, put me forward. All right, I'm going to, absolutely. My sister does actually, I was, 
um, all sorts of different mediums. So she works in sculpture, in painting, wow. in photo realism. She does a lot of different types of artwork. But in Australia, if you bought the Australian copy of A Brilliant Life, I'll just show it to you here. Please it's a different. That. It's a different edition. Oh, that's um, cool. And there's a photo section which you can find on my website. But you'll see Lillian's photos, and they are. There is a series where she took. Um, she, she took my mother's tattoo number from Auschwitz and put it on her arm, but really large and took photos of that and had it over her shoulders at one point. And it's a really moving piece. Can we only get that from you or is that something we can't get that in the United States, that version? You can buy that book I think, on Amazon. Hang on, just oh, okay. Um, but I, yeah, and it's it, there's an English version too that's hardcover and that's also got photos. But most of the photos are on my website, which is rochelleunreich.com. Oh, okay. You might have to go through the Australian Amazon um, site to get it because that's how I got my Harry Potter books after my mom bought the first three or four when they were there on a business trip. <laughs> oh, speaking of trip, Rochelle, has anyone... And my family told you that we saw your book on an air in, a, in an airport, like yes. front and center. Yeah, and then dad, the next time we went, it was gone, which means it was bought. <laughs> yeah, like all <laughs> that all was that landing guy. landing in Tucson for for the holidays. Uh, it was there, and then on the way out of Tucson at the holidays, it was sold out. Yeah, I literally mentioned wow. that last an hour ago that I never mind. Been available in Tucson airport. So. I mean, yeah. Max, I've not, I've not yet seen it kind of in the wild. I haven't seen anyone reading it, um, but I keep being told by people that they see they see it, people reading well, it. Well, it's because you're getting to places too late. They keep getting snatched up. Yeah, I hope that's <laughs> the case. I've never uh, known someone who's also had a book in a display at an airport. Like, you're, you're, <laughs> you're kind of the only one of those. So, uh, well, I did. it is like a kind cool of... Already. It's a, it is a kind of a crazy way it all happened because I did think it would end up in my desk drawer and now it's in, you know, just not just Australia, New Zealand, but the US and Canada, the UK and South Africa and about to have its first translation overseas too. And you just, you just don't uh, imagine any of those things will be true when you set out at your trusty computer and keypad to no, write. but you kind of should because <laughs> you're kind of... <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, I don't I know why you didn't, didn't expect this. <laughs> well, because my brother had been in publishing, I knew it doesn't really work that way. It can be well, a pretty good plans, but, but it was exciting. By the time I finished my, I wrote the first draft in six weeks. And by the time I finished, I had an agent. So that was really phenomenal. That, but wow. I did think it was those acts of serendipity. Like so many things fell into place that made all that happen. Are you yeah. working on another book? Please be no, at the moment, I'm just working on selling the hell out of this one. Um, <laughs> I really am. I feel like I'm yeah, really low, man. Like it will be the death of this salesman because I'm just going door to door. Um, I was at an event last night. I did a podcast before this. And tomorrow I go to Adelaide for the Adelaide Writers Festival, which is a really incredible writers festival in Australia, which will have lots of visiting American authors as well who've won pull it surprises and it's an incredible lineup um but I do think in the back of my mind what I'd like to do next and I'm just going to tell myself that it will happen because I really second guessed my ability to write this one for a long long time and that was that ended up being really discouraging not thinking I could do it and yeah. because I did do it and better than my wildest expectations I'm now just going to keep believing I can do another you should good I want you good, to good, good. um right. I'm so hungry. <laughs> My parents are starving me, guys. It's it, bad here. It's true. It's, it's abuse. I was looking on your Instagram to see the the stack of books of the other authors. Oh, at that uh, particular festival. And that's not a, an all conclusive and exhaustive list. But yes. Yeah, there's like um, Anne Enright and Jonathan Latham and Richard Flanagan, who's won a booker. Um, there's That's just amazing. 
an incredible lineup. Richard Ford. I mean, I've grown up, you know, I don't want to make Richard Ford sound old, but I've been reading Richard Ford for a long, long time. Rad kids. <laughs> there we go. Oh, fantastic. I yeah. Really. Yeah. I just love it when you do stuff. Thomas yeah. Keneally who wrote Schindler's Ark, which was Schindler's List was based on. You were talking about oh. that before. Um, <laughs> it is incredible. I was already uh, overstepping the boundaries with Jonathan Letha, the author, because we were on a panel together, an online panel, and I, I was just so beside myself when the organizer of this, which was Harper Library, sent the four of us on this panel a group email and I suddenly had Jonathan Lethem's email and <laughs> I just remember reading like Motherless Brooklyn and loving his books and so I fangirled him a bit and then when I found out he was coming to Adelaide I sent him a cheery note but I don't know if we'll cross paths because he's on later in the week. No but you have to though. <laughs> yeah, do, you, do you know what maxi awards are? No, tell me. I don't know either. It just says that I the book that I'm reading right now, um, good follow on to yours, but it has a totally different sort of perspective. But it's the father of a very, very good friend of mine who wrote his book about his mother called My Mother's War, mm. a Holocaust survivor's tribute to an extraordinary woman. But she was kind of the alter ego of your mother, I think, because she was much more... It was all about survival and doing whatever it took to to help her family survive and to doing many illegal things in order to make that happen and how she was able to sort of lie herself way out of situations that, well, I would have never been able to do it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I would have been done at the first instance, Honestly, but, but, it's a, but it's fascinating to read how different people reacted and dealt with these similar situations and and i like i said i think all these stories hold a lot of value um yeah. but but i think yours is one that really helps us live better that's so nice and i think my mother herself would have said that she probably didn't have the ingenuity to do what you've just described like to really kind of talk away into things in a way that were and that that wasn't that's nothing against that other woman's character because you did whatever you needed to. And as you see in the beginning of my book, David Milgram pretends to be a capo and like no one should judge him for that, of course, because you are in this situation that is very literally life or death and you use the resources you have and we all have different resources. It's... I think what really amazed me is just the way you had things interconnecting throughout the life like the um meeting up with him after the war and the story about the prayer books um that they bought when they got married being belonging to her second husband's father those coincidences are amazing too yeah yeah that felt like such a strong theme to me in my mother's life and I didn't know how it would play out in the book but it was really I think one of the reasons why I went to interview her in the first place I um I, when I sat down, it was partly to distract her because she was ill and I wanted to give her some respite and just make her feel a bit purposeful. But I wasn't necessarily, I, I certainly wasn't gathering material for a book because that was only at the back of my mind that one day I'd write her story. And it wasn't even to find out so much about what happened in the Holocaust because at that point, I actually thought that I had known it because she did uh, several testimonies. So it was really to find out that kind of thing like what did all these things that kept happening around her mean and did they have a meaning and did they point to something about the universe and the world we live in did they were they just acts of coincidence were they something more and I try not to label it in the book I want people to come up with their own conclusion that's meaningful for them about what these things meant but for me I just felt stronger in the belief than ever that the world is really connected and that there are unseen forces that we do not understand. Yeah. From, from everything I've heard and everything I've seen, it's it's truly kind of the book, the story, and the message. It's kind of the main tenant of how I choose to live my life, how I want to live my life. I think the best way where it's refusing to give in to misery 
refusing to allow yourself to live in a way that where it's not really life i'm so hungry i can't make good speech but <laughs> how good that was go eat baby there's nothing a thing to come to my house i made lasagna okay <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> i should probably go eat dinner but thank you for existing and um, <laughs> you for existing please write more <laughs> bye darling bye <laughs> so cute what time it's, is it for you rochelle um it's 12 o'clock which is much uh 12 o'clock noon which oh. is so much better than i did a podcast with the wonderful zibby owens the other day i don't know if you know zibby but she's an incredible book uh podcaster and uh, powerhouse but we we did that at one in the morning oh one to one ready and i'm not <laughs> sure that i make so much sense on that <laughs> but it's, you know, that harks back to my days of journalism. I was talking today about how once upon a time I had to interview three Kardashian sisters all in the middle of the night. Like one was scheduled at one, one was scheduled at three, one was at four. So there was no even sleeping in between. And then at the end of that, I had to write it up straight away for a story. So I'm kind of used to it. But I, I now I have to make sense, though, at those hours. Beforehand, I just had to ask questions. I don't know. I think you're clearly your mother's daughter. <laughs> in some ways. I'm not sure in every way. I really, <laughs> I'd like to be like her, but I don't know that my default is exactly hers. It's, But it does show you that that behavior can be learned behavior, too, because I've learned from it. It's not inherently me to be as optimistic as she was or as buoyant. It just, it's just not my makeup. But... I have learned from her what a better life you have if you can mimic that in some instances and just appropriate that from time to time. How how much of that did you use when you were doing press junkets? Because I don't I don't know if everybody else knows what your your writing history has been, but Rochelle was interviewing Matthew Perry and Morgan Freeman and I believe I asked you to tell Morgan Freeman, thank you for teaching me to read. And he said the checks or the bill is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> it's, possible. it's all a blur. Now I spent, so I've been a writer for 30, coming up on 38 years. And um, I started out doing a lot of celebrity journalism. So I was interviewing actors and then got lots of different beats along the way. So in Australia, I do a lot of lifestyle articles, a lot of fashion. It's changed along the way, but um, oh gosh, press junkets were just like survival of the loudest. And I don't know that I was that, uh, you know, you really had to push your way in. And I was, I was kind of the person that was like, um, excuse, sorry, uh, uh, you know, you're often in a room with other people and I would just like kind of be quietly raising my hand. I have become bolder as I've gotten older because I used to be, you know, growing up at school, I hated doing any sort of public speaking I would go to my first interviews when I was 19, 20 and just be so red faced and my heart would be beating. And now I just cannot get nervous. I'll be on a stage for, you know, with hundreds of people. And I just, there's something <laughs> along the way that I've learned to be a bit louder and a bit more um, comfortable in a public arena. So, yeah. I love that. I think, I think the world needs more of that from you. So I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I think, I think I write because I like connecting with people. And when you're out, out on a stage and you get to hear from readers and speak to people, that is sort of just a, such a pure form of connecting. Because of course, when you're writing, you don't see them reading your book and you hear, you don't hear from them with immediacy, but speaking to people, it's just so incredible to, to you know, you're reminded again and again and again of how different people are, about how their insights are so varied and how wonderful people are with everyone has not just one story, you know, that thing, everyone has a story, a novel in them, but everyone has a thousand, a million. It's incredible. How my microphone was doing something weird. <laughs> um, how, nope, it went away. This is the COVID fog. I had a really, really great question for you. And now it's gone. It's in the ethers. Uh, It'll come back. Have to, um, I've done that so many morning. times as a journalist, but 
you then you just <laughs> you learn that, like to get something else out of your mouth and then it comes back <laughs> I did it I got I got my ASL letter to remind myself when you do book readings what portion of the book do you choose to read so I've only done a couple and sometimes as someone's asked me to read a certain bit too, but I've often read the bit about my sisters, about uh, which follows on from my mother losing her sister Olga and me really reflecting on what it is to have a sister. And it's only a couple of pages about how I grew up with these older sisters who were so mysterious to me. I'd poke around in their teenage bedrooms as if I was an archaeologist on a dig and try and kind of glean things from their lives and that I didn't realize then when I was young when we had such an age difference what they would come to mean to me later and that corresponds with my mother losing Olga who was a number, more than a decade older than her she would not realize I think ever what she had really lost and I I realized that and write about that and I read it because it's kind of a self-contained piece. It's small. You don't really need to have too much context. Um, and I like that. And I, I've read bits about my synagogue as well at, when I was at synagogue. Um, there's, I, I won't say what it is, but there's one like clunky line in there that, did, that got, um, it's a shame because I really like this section, but it turned out in my editing, I was like driving my publishers nuts just you know, they asked for 50 changes at maximum, I would have 350. And along the way there, there came, and I haven't read the book since I've written it, but Julie and my son found this sort of Frankenstein line in there, which was a version of how it was. And then what I wanted to change and just became terrible. And so I think, oh, I can't read that out loud. I'd be actually scared to read too many parts out in case because I am that person that would just go, oh, I wish I hadn't written it that way. And then it would, it would play in my mind over and over and I actually wouldn't be able to think about anything else. So I think I'll stick to those two little sections. Those are good. Yeah. Those are definitely yeah. good sections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to let you know uh, that we have on on the call, There's a there's a letter that's coming to you. I don't know how long it takes for the males to get from here to Australia. It seems like it's very, very variable. Um, but Susan, who is on here, made something for me to send to you. And then she made me a, a second one. And it is a little, oh my is it, it's God. a suede bluebird bookmark That's for you. incredible, so. Susan. It's beautiful. Isn't that gorgeous? She made, she made so me one too. They are spectacular they're, gorgeous. they're absolutely gorgeous susan so on here cool. and Anne is her sister oh wow i can't Anne. believe that i'm so touched thank you i will definitely i love a bookmark and i never have um a bookmark i end up using you know bits of paper or ruining my spine <laughs> so that's perfect and i think i think i have here look i have a little bluebird brooch right here on my desk oh um, that really was so nice that you did that. So that's that'll be arriving probably tomorrow morning. Wow. Timing. Timing it, timing's everything, right? That's incredible. Could, Thank you. I mean, crafty it's, people. I tell yeah. you, it, of course, you're all a crafty bunch. It is amazing, I think, people's creativity and how you can use that to reach out to people and make a connection as well. I mean, there's so much about, I think, deep thought and creativity being partners. I really think the two are so connected. Yeah. And I've definitely found that with the Craplet people over and over again, I mean, it's been 18 years now, over and over again, the people who are drawn to the books and who are drawn to the crafting are makers. They're like your mom. They're, they're not terror downers. They are out there to build up. Yeah. Or, or what was it? Brenda Dane used to say, make the sock, the world better one sock at a time. Yes. <laughs> well, you guys will probably like that. Um, I did these two very small book events at my mother's house, which we still have. And it's a wild entry back into 1970. I could just I think I this. have pictures of it. Keep yeah. It's a really kind of immersive experience going back in time, but I, 
I, I'm not a crafter, but I made these homemade horseshoe biscuits that I write about in the book and put them on uh, little crockery plates, floral plates that I found at different op shops, you know, for $2 each and gave those as gifts. And I've really been trying to put my hand on things. So the other thing I did was, um, yes, that's the outside of it. The other thing I did was I have written little handwritten notes and sealed them with a little wax seal. Yeah, there's her crazy place. Um, and I've, I've put these, I've tried to give some of these notes to booksellers or sometimes I bring them to oh. where they're just addressed dear reader and they're, they're all different. I don't have a template. I just write whatever. Sometimes I, I, it's sort of crazy. I think some people must think, why am I getting this? But I feel like it's almost like getting a tarot card. You get the one that's meant for you. But I like the idea of basically creating something and inserting that with my work if I can somewhere along the line. There are the biscuits and see a little bluebird there. Oh, wait, see the lovely back. Andrew. Oh, oh that's nice. charming. Oh my yeah. gosh. And there's Rochelle's Andrew. Yes, he's mentioned in the book as the person that I meet and he's the last person thanked. What a it's lovely good. home. And by the way, it's an Airbnb. So if anyone, if anyone. <laughs> where, I was where, about to ask, is that an Airbnb somewhere? Because book me a flight. I need to go yeah. to my own house. <laughs> where, yeah. where is it in Australia? In Melbourne. In, oh. So it's the house I grew up in. Okay. And, yeah. And that's who sang it to, yeah, he's got an incredible operatic voice. He's really he, phenomenal. He does. And if any of you go and look up Rochelle on, on Instagram, um, there are several places where you can hear him sing and it is lovely. And there's, yeah. there's some clips of you doing a, it looked like a promo trailer for Harper Collins and also, um, clips of your mom speaking yeah. that I, I assume are clips from that that same correct uh, file that's got sent yeah. to Shoah. yeah if you look at um there's three of them on Hachette's Australia Instagram page on their reels uh it was really incredible like I've got to say I've been with the most amazing publishers all over the world like I just and I had quite a bit of a choice in Australia because it was part of a book auction um but I chose Hachette and I have not looked back here because they have really backed it. And over Christmas, my book was on the side of a bus and they sent a film crew from Sydney to Melbourne, which is, um, I don't know, probably like New York to Boston to film a trailer that would help promote the book. And that's where we, that's the little clip you saw. And I've just had the same Harper Collins in America have been phenomenal. Um, Sarah Nelson, who is my publisher, has really taken it upon herself to make sure these stories land in the world. She published The Tattooist of Auschwitz. She published The Escape Artist and many more. She's incredible at getting the word out. So, um, yeah, Vanessa Radnage in Australia, Sarah. I've had an incredible woman, Susanna, in the UK with uh, Black and White Publishing. They've, I just really landed well. Like, I do feel someone's looking out for me there because unless you self-publish a book, you really rely on this team of people to make it happen and... I can write whatever I write, but then they have to hire editors and proofreaders and a sales team, marketing, publicity. And, you know, even with all my connections as a journalist, I'd say I came nowhere near landing the sort of coverage I got that my publicist did at Hachette. She really made it all happen. And wow. they've been, they've really looked after me. What's the first translation? You said it's getting the first translations coming out. What language is that I going to be? I don't know if I can actually say that because I haven't signed the contract. So I'm slightly oh. aware. It'll be um, in in Europe. But Excellent. It's a really weird way the book world works. So you can, I think I, the, my book was, I think, almost out in the UK before I had even, I'm not sure at what point I signed the contract, but everything kind of rolls ahead on a very gentleman's agreement sort of shake, handshake. It's really remarkable. So I probably can say it, but I've got to ask. I don't it's, want to get in trouble with it. No, we don't want you to get in trouble. <laughs> no. But that's, it's lovely to know that there is some, some large industry left that actually functions that way. I'm telling it's you, a, I never knew group. this. Publishing is, and I, I've been lucky, but like I, it's, they're just, 
Like they're really what they advertise. Like they're they're passionate about the word. They want to collaborate. It's a team. It's a team effort. Everyone asks me if I'm okay with this or that, and can I have my input? And as a journalist, you know, I've never, I've barely ever chosen a headline in my life for an article. I usually don't get to see it before it goes to print. I don't choose the photos or the captions. Um, it, it's different. I'm not complaining because that industry was really good to me too. But this one feels, yeah, I thought I'd really be aged out of this industry by the time I got to it. I imagine that I'd be competing with all these kind of young debut authors and people more famous than me, people more, you know, traveled, but they've just taken it on the basis of that they love the book. And it's so human. Like my, when my agent told my publisher, Vanessa in Australia, that she was the winning person who got it, she burst out crying. And I just don't know if it would happen in like any other, well, I'm sure it does happen in other industries, but I haven't experienced it yet. No, no, that's, that doesn't happen very much in Hollywood. I don't think. Not when I was there. No, nor I. <laughs> they made wow. people, but not that way. <laughs> <laughs> For different reasons. Yeah. Uh, completely different reasons. Yeah, exactly. So I, I should tell everyone that the way Rochelle, it's, it, it's a strange coincidence that somebody in Los Angeles and somebody in Melbourne, Australia would wind up meeting each other. Yeah. But it was, I was working at the UCLA guest house, which was our on campus. It was like a 62 room hotel, just a little, little, little hotel. And every, every week, everybody had to work at least one midnight to 6 a.m. shift, or every two weeks, everyone had to work a midnight to 6 a.m. shift. So I was on, on the desk and, you know, by three o'clock in the morning, you are either high on coffee or you're reading the Stephen King book that somebody stashed underneath the the desk so that you can keep yourself awake <laughs> and the phone rang which made me jump a mile and there was this lovely australian voice saying hi my friends and i are coming we're staying with you and we just wanted to find out we're going to be there over the winter holidays is anything going to be open and it's los angeles so it's like, well what are you looking for because i'm sure we can set you up with something and my boyfriend at the time marcello who's in that ridiculous picture with us <laughs> was the wound up being a tour guide for you guys it was so much fun it was yeah, serendipity was, in the exactly. best way I remember so you know that was way obviously but way before the internet way before anything and in Australia you generally got any material from America six months later so for traveling you relied on guidebooks and there was this tiny little line in Lonely Planet that said if you're in Los Angeles, consider staying at the UCLA guest house. And so I waited up till wow. after midnight to call you. And um, you got to remember that then it was like we were in such a faraway land before the internet. Everything was delayed. Movies were delayed. You just didn't have any immediate connection with America. But strangely enough, when when as an Australian, when I grew up in the 60s, almost all of my pop culture references and um, literature I read, movies I saw were American. So I grew up watching the same TV my counterparts would have, Brady Bunch and I Dream of Jeannie and Mr. Ed. And I read <laughs> the books we studied at school were probably very similar to what you, st I mean, I, we studied The Scarlet Letter and we studied Moby Dick. Like we studied actually American and English books. Um, and, and I would read Archie comic, comics and just and dream of hostess Twinkies, which we didn't have, and dream of <laughs> camp, which we didn't have in the same way, or a prom, which we didn't have. And, and ev everything about America just seemed like this fantastical, amazing land that I'd been dreaming of. And this was, I think, my, it was my first trip to, my first trip to America. And so even American accents just filled me with glee. There were hardly any Americans at the time that would come traveling. And when they did, you'd really notice them. So just, you know, from my perspective, I was so excited to speak to you and have this person being friendly on the other line. And it sort of sounded like America was going to be everything I wanted it to be, you know, <laughs> friendly people. And it felt in a funny way, like at the time, I felt quite disconnected from Australia in a way that I don't anymore. But at the time, um, being Jewish in Australia was very different 
to being born Australian in Australia. And I didn't see so many touch points of my religion anywhere. I went to a Jewish school, so everyone there was Jewish, but you know, you didn't around Christmas time, you didn't go into a store and see Hanukkah cards. You didn't see Jewish New Year cards around that time. You didn't see any sort of evidence apart from in your own community that that Jewish people were integrated in that larger world. And I knew that wasn't the case in America. I would read American authors and Jewish authors writing about the Jewish American experience like Philip Roth. We didn't have a Philip Roth here that I was reading when I was growing up. And I just sort of couldn't, I felt that it was a place that I could kind of be free and feel a bit at home to in that way. So the whole thing was remarkable. That's very cool. I'm so glad it worked out. And I think we we must have run up a, a hellacious bill for your mother because that I'm was sure. her long distance. <laughs> That was back in the day when you called someone long distance and it would kind of go beep, 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 beep. and then you'd go, I remember if I'd call anyone, they'd go, honey, Rochelle's on the phone, like come quickly. You know, it was, it was a real event when you called someone and I know we spoke for like an hour at least at, on the, at least. on several calls. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Those were good. Those were good calls. Clearly. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that well, probably how lucky me. for us that you met met each other and and for you to give us this a very special book. Absolutely. It has been a very um sort of key character in my life for lots of reasons. In fact, I think that I, I remember feeling really kind of connected to New York, well Los Angeles surely when I lived there, and then New York again. And you were also the first person who introduced me to the idea of the internet, which I had no idea about, but you did. Um, so you were really significant in lots of ways along the way. And one of the things I remember so much is, um, your grandmother-in-law who, yeah, Vera. your, your, sorry, your mother-in-law, mother-in-law, no, it's your no, grandmother-in-law, yep. Vera, um, Vera, who, uh, when I moved to New York and Andrew's mother would be at these parties that he would have and that but you'd often have these very lively theater parties with theatrical people and creative people and there was Vera you know in all of her old age and splendor sitting and learning about people and it really gave me a different view of old people and how one could be as an older person and also how one could be as a younger person treating an older person that was a really kind of informative a moment for me and I remember speaking about Vera like to my mom and to other people and I think she might have met my mother too. I think she might have too. Yeah. yeah. And Vera and your mom would have been if we had let them loose on the city. Yeah. <laughs> Vera, Vera I, I don't know if anybody else knows, Vera was uh, the night that I met her was at one of Andrew's, I surprised Andrew at his show Gilgamesh not realizing that his family would be there and didn't know me and didn't know I was going to be there. And so I wound up kind of awkwardly talking to Vera at one point. And, you know, after you talk about the weather and what book you've just finished reading, I said, well, have, are there any movies you've liked? And she's 84 years old, Andrew, 82, 84. And she said, oh, I like Pulp Fiction quite a lot. <laughs> and I thought, I love you. This yes. is awesome. Yeah, no, she was so kind of contemporary and so open-minded and um, it made me really stop thinking that one should pigeonhole an older person now that I'm getting older myself. <laughs> I to yeah. Listen to and the young Yeah. Yep. Great. Yes. Well, thank you so much. You have given us an hour and a half. I don't want to take any more of your time because I know you have to prepare to go to Adelaide. <laughs> Oh, no, it's all good. I've really enjoyed this. I remember coming on once before because not to speak, but we discussed a book and it was so fun and I recognized some of the faces from then. So yep. thank you for having me. Thank you thank all you for, for coming. The book thank you. So much for that really makes me happy. And thanks for remembering Mira. I hope she stays in your heart for a little while longer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Very yeah, much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will look forward to seeing your Instagram feed for the Adelaide writers. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Bye, everyone. All right. I'll Bye. be in Here. touch about the Tucson Book Festival. So we're going to stay Excellent. in touch. Do that. Amazing. I'll fly myself up anytime for festivals, that's for sure.
Right. Yay. All right. All right. We'll meet in Tucson. <laughs> See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.